Hey everyone, happy Monday. So in this video, I wanted to go over a few different concepts pertaining to the things you might learn in calculus. There are things that I taught a couple weeks ago in my own calculus class, but my students requested maybe a little bit more detailed information, maybe some examples to help them understand the concepts. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about numerical integration and Riemann sums. And Riemann sums are something that helps us understand the concept of integration through the use of approximations. So remember that the whole reason that we learn integrals in the first place, well, the main reason is because it tells us the area under a curve. So if we have some generic function, I'm gonna, I'm not even gonna try to shade it, but you get the point. Imagine the entire area between the curve and the x-axis going from this boundary, we're gonna call it this A, up until this boundary, which we will call B. So remember, it's the second fundamental theorem of calculus that tells us that if we have a function f of x like this, and we have a clear starting point and a clear ending point, we can easily figure out the area under the curve by taking the definite integral from A to B of our function, lowercase f of x dx. And remember that it's the second fundamental theorem of calculus that tells us that this answer is going to be the antiderivative. Capital F is the antiderivative of lowercase f. So it's going to be the antiderivative when we plug in our high endpoint. And then we're going to subtract the antiderivative when we plug in our low endpoint A. So this is how we find the area under the curve. It's all well and good. But remember that before we can walk, we have to crawl. Before we know how to do integrals, we want to understand how to approximate the area under a curve to help us get a really good intuition of what it really means to integrate a function. So remember that there's also a nitty gritty technical definition of this exact same thing. Kind of like how with derivatives, we have a limit definition for a derivative. We also have a nitty gritty complicated but reliable limit definition of an integral. So it's given by this, the definite integral from A to B d of f of x dx is given by the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i times delta x. And I want to get into each of these things little by little, bit by bit, I should say to help us understand the big picture, but this isn't the main concept of the video, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. This should just be a quick refresher. So remember that N is gonna be the number of rectangles in a Riemann sum. So a Riemann sum looks like this. So instead of finding the exact area under a curve, we're finding an approximate area by adding together a bunch of rectangles. So that's one rectangle. That's another rectangle. And notice how for this one, I'm only going as high as it takes the left endpoint to reach the curve. So this rectangle has a left endpoint that reaches the curve right here. This one reaches the curve right here. They're all going to be as high as it takes for the left endpoint to reach the lowest curve height. So I'm not going to bore you with, with all the details with drawing all the rectangles, but this should give you an idea of what it means to take a Riemann sum. So notice how it doesn't give us a good area at all. We are missing a significant portion of our area right there that's being left out. And this part right here is being left out. And notice how with our next rectangle, this part's being added when it shouldn't be added at all to the area. So the idea is that if we use smaller rectangles, we get a better area. And I'm gonna skip ahead and add much, much skinnier rectangles just to illustrate this point a little bit better. So I'm gonna use really skinny rectangles. Oops, wrong color. So that is the first rectangle. And again, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details. I'm not gonna painstakingly draw every rectangle. I just want us to understand that the more rectangles there are, the skinnier the rectangles there are, means that we're gonna have a much better area. So notice how this area, this margin of error is much smaller than the one we had with bigger rectangles. So the more rectangles we have, the closer we get to the actual area under the curve. The skinnier the rectangles means the Riemann sum is gonna be closer and closer to the actual integral. So 
in theory, if we have an infinite number of rectangles, if the number of rectangles reaches infinity, we're going to have the exact area we're looking for. There's not going to be any margin of error. It's not going to be an approximation. It's going to be the actual area, 100% correct, if we have an infinite number of rectangles. So that's what this limit as n approaches infinity represents. We're taking n, the number of rectangles, towards infinity. We might start with four rectangles, and then we'll increase to eight, and then to 16, and then 32, and then 64. We'll keep going on and on and on and on until we have an infinity number, until we have an infinite number of rectangles. And only then do we have the exact area we're looking for. So this next part, we're taking the sum of something. Whenever we see this capital Greek letter sigma, it means we're adding together a bunch of stuff. It means in this case, we're adding together a bunch of rectangles. So this means we're adding the first rectangle value to the second value, to the third value, to the fourth value, to the fifth rectangle area, to the sixth rectangle area, up until the, the area of the nth rectangle, which is gonna be the, the very last rectangle as we reach infinity. So we technically can't reach infinity, it's not a number, but this is saying that we're gonna to add together an infinite number of rectangles. We're gonna add all of their areas together to get the total area under the curve. And the things that we're adding together always occur to the right of the Greek letter, the right of the sigma. So this is all the stuff that gets added. So remember that the area of a rectangle is base times height. So if this is one rectangle, the area of just one of these rectangles, like I said, is base times height. So delta x, change in x, that's our base. And remember that we're only going as high as the function itself, as high as we need to go for the left endpoint to reach the lowest part of the curve. That is f of c sub i. So f of x is our function. And forgive me, I, don't, I have no idea where the c sub i came from, but that's just the general convention we use to notate that we're plugging in this value, we use c sub i instead of x, instead of anything else to, to indicate that this is the value of x that we really care about. So if this c sub i, this height is f of c sub i. So area of a rectangle is base times height. This is the base right here, delta x, and this is the height, f of c sub i. So altogether, this is the area of just one rectangle we're doing this an infinite number of times and we're adding them all together. So that's how we go from having the area of just one rectangle, having the area of an infinite number of rectangles to give us the true value of the definite integral as we know it to be. So let's talk about some other ways we can get the same information. So let's pretend we don't know anything about integration yet, nothing about integral calculus, and we're being asked to find the area under this curve. Well, technically it's not a curve, it's a line, but you get the gist. So let's say we have the expression given by y equals negative two x plus two. And we're being asked to find the area from zero up until the only x-intercept. So we can tell that the x-intercept is gonna have to be one when x is equal to one, y is equal to zero, and our y-intercept is gonna be two. So what if we're asked to find the value of this integral? So it's pretty simple, but like I said, we're gonna pretend we don't know anything about integration. We don't know anything about antiderivatives, so we're, we need to approach this in a different way. So remember earlier when I mentioned how the second fundamental theorem of calculus is the thing that establishes the relationship between the definite integral and the area under a curve. So that being said, this expression right here is simply gonna be the area under the curve or the area under the line, same thing, going from zero to one. So it's gonna be all of this shaded area, this triangle area is what this integral is gonna be valued to. So we have a formula for geometry that we can use to help us get this area, to get this answer. So the area of a triangle is gonna be one half base times height. So we have one half, we can tell our base is one, our height is two. So we just did an integral without doing an integral. Pretty powerful stuff, pretty cool, right? We use geometry to get us the exact same answer that an integral would give us. And this is a pretty nifty trick because there are gonna be some things that we can't take the integral of. There are gonna be some things that don't have an elementary antiderivative. 
And this is going to be one of my famous tangents that I go on, but I promise not to go too in depth because it's not the main topic of this video. So one of my favorite functions is this right here. I guess I should use the proper notation out of respect. This right here, f of x is negative x squared over two. So this is really, really common in statistics. This is the normal distribution. It is a bell curve. And again, I learned my lesson last time. I'm not gonna go too far into this tangent, but I wanna give you the essentials and how it relates to the topic of the video. So like I said, this is a bell curve in statistics. It tells us the probability of a random variable being drawn and having a value occurring between point A and point B. So the way we would calculate this probability is by taking the definite integral of our function, of the normal distribution function. And this is like rolling a dice with infinitely many outcomes between zero and one. And this function is what tells you the probability of picking a value that's between A and B. Pretty cool stuff, but like I said, this is one of those functions where there's no clear elementary antiderivative. This is gonna be something called the error function. So this is something that you would actually have to use a computer to calculate. There's no elementary antiderivative, so you would use a calculator or some computer function to tell you the value of this definite integral. And there is another example we can do too, something that is a little more accessible, something that's easy to understand a little bit more than that last one. So let's say we have a quarter of a circle and we know that the equation of a circle is given by this. It's gonna be y equals the square root of r squared, that's radius squared, minus x squared. This is the equation of a circle. So let's say we wanted to find this area. I know it doesn't look like a real quarter of a circle, but bear with me, that's the best I can do, get used to it. So let's say we wanted to find the area of this quarter of a circle expressed like this. It's gonna be the integral going from zero to one of our function given. So it's going to be one squared minus x squared dx. So this is gonna be one of those other functions where there's no elementary antiderivative. Even when you successfully complete the class, you're not gonna have any tools to help you find this antiderivative. This is too advanced for normal methods. So we're gonna use a different approach to get the exact same answer to get this area. So we know from geometry that the area of a circle is pi r squared. r is the radius, which is one in this case. So it's pi times one squared. But this is only a quarter of the entire circle. This is what the entire circle should look kind of like, not quite egg-shaped like that, but you get the picture. This is a quarter of a circle, so we're going to divide the entire thing by four. So there. This is another situation where we can solve an integral without doing a lick of calculus. No derivatives, no actual integration, no antiderivatives. We get the same answer as we would if we could by taking this antiderivative and applying the second fundamental theorem. So we get the same answer by using geometry. So that's called numeric integration. Anytime we use a Riemann sum, or a calculator or a geometry formula is to get the same answer as an integral, that's called numerical integration. And if you're in a position to be taking the AP exam, you're gonna be doing not a whole lot of that, but it's still a really, really good idea to understand how the process works. There's going to be a calculator section of the test and a non-calculator section. Uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to have at least one numerical integration problem on the calculator section. So it's worth your while to go through that and review it to make sure you know exactly how to do it for when the time comes. So I wanna go over just a few more things in this video. This isn't strictly numerical integration, but it is part of the big picture. So this is gonna be another, it's kind of a Riemann sum, but not exactly. So remember at the beginning of the video when I was making my first Riemann sum, we have a left endpoint rectangle right there, and then another left endpoint rectangle. So you can choose what endpoint you want to use to decide your rectangle height. You can have left-hand rectangles like this, 
or you could have right-hand rectangles. So that would look something like this. If we want to use the right endpoint instead of the left endpoint, I'm going to do my best to make them all have the same width. So I'm going to use the right endpoint this time. And it gets us a similar answer. Depending on what kind of function it is, you're going to have either a more accurate or a less accurate depiction of the area approximation. So this is what you would get if you use the right endpoint. But you can also get an even better one than both of those, better than the left and better than the right, by using a midpoint. So I'm, I'm going to go as high as it takes for the midpoint to reach the lowest function height, the lowest part of the curve. And I'm not going to draw all of them. I'm just going to draw enough for you to get an idea of how this process works. And this is going to give you a much better approximation than the left hand and the right hand Riemann sum. So this is another example of Riemann sum. And then the next thing I want to show you is not even a Riemann sum at all. It's similar, but not exactly like the ones we've been seeing. So this is called the trapezoidal rule. So as you can imagine, just by hearing the name, we're going to be using trapezoids to get a similar answer as we would with a Riemann sum. We're going to be using rectangle, sorry, we're going to be using trapezoids in the same way we would be using rectangles. And I'll show you what that looks like. So what we wanna do is instead of making rectangles, we wanna make trapezoids. So we want to make a line that goes up to the function height for every value of X. And then we're gonna make a line like that. So that's our first trapezoid. And then we have another one. I think I can do a better job than that. So that's another one. And then this is our third trapezoid. And then the fifth trapezoid, the fourth trapezoid, I mean. And then the fifth trapezoid, and then you get the picture by now how this works. So the trapezoidal rule tells us that we can approximate a definite integral like this. So this is our generic function. f of x dx. It's going to be not equal to, but approximately equal to. The trapezoidal rule gives us an approximation, not an actual answer. So the integral is approximately equal to 1 half h times f of x1 plus 2 times f of x2 plus f of x3 plus, skip a few, plus f of x to the n minus, sorry, x sub n minus 1. So this is going to be the second to the last trapezoid right here, close parentheses, plus f of x sub n getting really close to the edge, but we'll make it work. So this is gonna give you the total amount we get by adding together all the trapezoids going from A to B. And let's talk about what all of the, all this means really quick. So H will make a little bit more sense if we take a trapezoid and we tip it onto its side. So I'm gonna take this first trapezoid, I'm gonna draw it rotated 90 degrees to the right. And my drawing is pathetic, as you know by now. I am no artist. So feel free to score me for it in the comments. So this is going to be the rect the sorry, the trapezoid rotated 90 degrees to the right. So H stands for height. So if we're dealing with a, tra a trapezoid in this orientation, the height's given by this. And then this is going to be x sub 1, and this is going to be x sub 2 or sorry, I should say f of x sub 1 and f of x sub 2. f of x sub 1, and then f of x sub 2. So this x value is x sub 1, this x value is x sub 2, and then we have x sub 3. 
x sub 4. This is going to be the second to the last one. It's x sub 5 or x to the n minus 1. And then b is going to represent x sub 6 or x sub n. And this is f of x sub n. It's the function height we get when we plug in x sub n. So the, re the way this came about is because the area of a trapezoid is going to be 1 half h times the, the sum base 1 plus base 2. So instead of base 1, we have x of f of x sub 1. Whoops. Instead of base 1, it's going to be f of x sub 1. And instead of base 2, we have f of x sub 2. So this is the area of the first trapezoid. The second one is going to be 1 half h, almost identical to the first one, except instead of f of x sub 1 and f of x sub 2, we're going to have f of x sub 2 and f of x sub 3 for our second trapezoid. Those are the values that pertain to the two bases of the second trapezoid tilted onto its side. So it's going to be the sum f of x sub 2 plus f of x sub 3. Whoops, I keep forgetting that part. Shame on me. f of x sub 2 should be added separately to f of x sub 3. And then you're going to do that for all the rectangles. So I'm going to skip a few and show you what it's going to look like for the very last. Oh, I said a rectangle again. Sorry, I meant trapezoid. So we're going to skip a few, and I'm going to show you the exact same thing and how it's going to look for our very last trapezoid. So same thing, 1 half h. And then we have, in this case, it's going to be f of x minus 1. f of x sub n minus 1, I should say, minus f, no, plus. I'm losing it right now. I'm sorry plus f of x sub n. I can feel my voice going away from lack of use. It's really sad. So the way we get all of this from this stuff that we just wrote down below is by doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation. Notice how they all have a 1 half h as a factor. So we're going to factor that out of the whole thing from this term and this term, all the terms here, and then the last term. They all have one half each. So we can factor it out from the whole thing to make life easier for us. And then notice how we have an f of x sub 2 and then another f of x sub 2. We're also going to have an f of x sub 3 and another f of x sub 3 f of x sub n minus 1, and then another f of x sub n minus 1. And the reason for that is because if we look at the walls shared by consecutive trapezoids, notice how both of these trapezoids have a height of f of x sub 2. And notice how these two trapezoids both have a height of f of x sub 3. They both share that height. The next two share this height. The next two trapezoids share this height. But if you look at the very first and the very last that I'm outlining in blue, notice how these two aren't shared by any other trapezoids. The blue heights are held by only the first trapezoid and the last trapezoid. So these walls, these blue walls, aren't being shared by two trapezoids like the red ones are. So that's why we only have f of x sub 1 being counted once, and f of x sub n only being counted once, but all the rest of them are being counted twice. So we have f of x sub 2, f of x sub 2 again, f of x sub 3, we're going to have another f of x sub 3 in here. We're going to have 2 f of x 
f of x of n sub 1. I can't even talk right now. <laughs> Sorry, we're going to have two f of x sub n minus 1s as well, because those are heights being shared by two consecutive trapezoids. Their wall is being shared by two trapezoids. And that's why if we go back to the thing we have at the top, this business right here, all this stuff, that's why all the ones in the middle are being doubled because they're all being shared by two trapezoids. But the first one is not, and the second one is not either. That's why those two aren't getting doubled when all the middle ones are. So I'm not going to go into detail and bore you to tears with a super tricky example of this. But I wanted to just give my students the basics and a pretty concise understanding of where the trapezoidal approximation rule even comes from. I wanted to give a quick explanation on why this is, why this is true. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It was pretty exciting, pretty fun. And I'll see you in the next video. Ciao.